Welcome to COS284's first assembler lecture. As I mentioned in the original admin video, there are really kind of two streams of content within this module. The first is with regards to computer architecture theory, and the second is with regards to assembler programming. So we're going to focus on the, the latter of those two today. So the first couple of things to keep in mind about the assembler programming that we're going to discuss is that it's rather specific in nature and that we're actually focusing on Firstly, 64-bit assembler programming, and secondly, Intel assembler programming. Now, that's not to say that if you have an AMD processor, it will not work. Intel and AMD both use the same base architecture, but it's just something to keep in mind that we're discussing and going to learn a programming language that is a specific assembler. So assembler across different architectures are in fact different, but we're focusing on x86 architecture, which is basically the standard architecture of the von Neumann machines you're most used to. The exception to that kind of architecture is what you will encounter on some of your cell phones, which is uh, derived from what we call, or the company that developed it is called ARM, and it's a slightly different type of syntax. So we're not going to focus on that, though I suspect it's unlikely we all encounter that version of assembler too much in the wild. So what are our goals for this part of content? Well, there's a couple of goals and they're not all mutually exclusive, but it's good to kind of go through some of them. The one is to learn internal data formats. Now, obviously that's not the focus of the assembler component, but it is important to understand how your data is being represented when working in assembler. So this is a nice marriage between the theory and the application in that, for example, understanding how integers and floating point numbers are actually stored at a byte level or a bit level rather is very important to effective use of assembler programming. So that's where we can try and merge chapter two's material from the theory work with the theory. Then as I said, we're going to be learning 64-bit Intel slash AMD assembly instructions or more specifically x86 instructions. You will sometimes see the 64-bit variant of assembler referred to as x64. But regardless, the idea is the fundamental architecture is actually x86. Now you may be wondering why there are only two kind of CPU manufacturers that use this base architecture, or this instruction set rather. And it's actually because Intel owns the license to x86 instruction set. And AMD is the only company in the world that has a license to use that instruction set. It's quite a prohibitive license. There is a lot of clauses about if AMD sells, things like that, that they may lose the license. So it's very much a duolo duopoly at this point between the two. And by and large, Intel has full say over that instruction set. So while AMD is doing very well currently, they are in some regards kind of at the mercy of what Intel decides to do. Later on, when we discuss some vectorized uh, instructions, we'll actually see a bit of a distinction as to the root Intel versus AMD has gone. But for the moment, you can assume they're using the same instruction set. One of the other goals, obviously, is we want to be able to write pure assembler programs. So from start to end, everything is going to be in x86 assembler. A fair amount of the early material is going to focus on that type of assembler programming. But later on, we're going to do what I find to be quite interesting, and I think probably very practically relevant, more so than just writing pure assembler programming, is to actually mix C and C++ programming with the assembler. Now, in general, you wouldn't implement a full system in assembler. You would rather implement a section of your program that is very computationally heavy or very important to your system and you might want to try and eke out some extra performance and it's in that situation where you might get to the point where you'd rewrite it in direct assembler. It's unlikely you would build a full enterprise system in assembler, at least in the modern era it is unlikely. Obviously in early computer systems you would have full systems written in assembler programs. This was before we had slightly more reasonable high level languages but generally now you'll only use a subset or in practice, you would only implement a subset in assembler. We're also going to make use of the GDB debugger. So you may have encountered that already from your C++ era. I will say that in the context of assembler programming, you really need to use this debugger. It is not easy to simply use C out statements in assembler. It's actually even a bit tricky to output to the screen correctly in assembler. So you need to make sure you become good friends with GDB as it's going to be quite vital for your success, particularly when we do slightly more complicated things. So spend some time getting used to using GDB. 
there is quite a few uh, little subsections in the textbook going over those details. So I will expect you to be able to use GDB. I won't expect you to memorize the commands, but I do expect you to be able to use it, particularly when you debug your own programs. Some of the things we're going to focus with in the assembler is we're going to try and figure out how to use floating point instructions. There are obviously well, maybe not that obviously, but there are kind of two ways of doing floating point instructions. There's the old approach and the more modern vectorized approach. We're going to focus on the latter approach, but this is quite late in the book, comparatively speaking, so we'll get there a little bit later on. We're also going to obviously work with arrays and some variants of arrays. So we, what we get what you call array-based instructions in assembler, which are quite useful. And we'll obviously work with normal arrays. We're also going to work with functions now, obviously, you've all been programming for a fair amount of time by now. So you've written programs in C++ and Java at least, and probably in more languages. In assembly, it's a little bit more tricky to write functions. And that's because you actually have to build the whole function structure. So we'll discuss how you can build stack frames and things of that nature. So pretty much in assembly, nothing is given to you for free. You have to build all the structures you want to use, and we're going to go through how that's actually done. It will also give you a good understanding of how C++ is actually implementing its underlying functions, and the same thing applies to other high-level languages. We're then going to use structs in assembler. So structs are exactly like the, the concept you understand from C++. The distinction now is we're interacting with them from assembler. And we'll actually go through how we can build and use structs such that I can use and pass them between assembler and C++. I'll also briefly mention how we can actually integrate the use of functions and things like that in an assembler level, but we won't spend too much time on doing things like that. Mostly going to focus on more the data side of, of a class or a struct. We're then also going to talk about using system calls, both directly and indirectly. You'll see from the start almost you'll be using simple system calls to output to the screen and later on we'll go through some more complicated system calls and kind of distinguish between system calls for different operating systems. And then to round things off we're going to go through some data structures in assembler so we're going to build things like linked lists and trees and binary search trees and the like in assembler. We're also going to do some simple hash tables and graphs. It's not going to be to the extent of data structure that you're used to from COS212, but we are going to be building some interesting structures nonetheless in assembler. And then the last thing that I'm going to discuss is some high performance aspects of assembler programming. That's often the reason you want to write assembler programming is you try to gain either on space or on speed. And as a result, it's quite important, I feel, that I can communicate to you what the or how you can exploit assembler to get the maximum performance out of your code. That said, some of the things I will discuss in that section of the material are actually quite similar in languages like C++, but you kind of have a more bare bones level of accessing that functionality. So I feel that that's quite an interesting component to end off our assembler content on. So I suppose before we actually delve into the assembler programming, we should kind of have a good pros and cons of using any language. So in this case, what are the pros and cons of using an assembler language? Now there's more, pro, more cons than pros by and large to using assembler programming, which is why you need to have a good reason to want to use it in your production system. But originally, obviously, people didn't have many choices. You had pretty much machine code and assembler programming was a step up from that. And eventually we now have high level languages, but for a long time we were kind of trapped at this level of, of assembler programming. So what are the downsides? Well, the biggest aspect really is non-portability. So you would ideally like to be able to implement something on one architecture and it should run on another architecture. And generally, if you write things in, say, C++, you can kind of assume that you'll have a reasonable chance of getting a compiler to make it run across different operating systems. There are some caveats, but it's not too bad to do. And obviously, you have the nicer example of, say, Java, which should run on most things just using the JVM. But obviously with assembler programming, we're really communicating directly with the CPU, so it has to work on the current machine. So different CPU means different assembler instruction set. So as I said, we're talking about the x86 architecture, but your cell phone in particular uses processor or instructions from the ARM side of things. We'll discuss ARM in the context of um, instruction set design late in the theory aspect in essence the big difference is in the difference between or the big difference between ARM and x86 will be that your x86 mm -hmm. architecture uses what we call a 
CISC instruction set. So it stands for a complex instruction set computer. And ARM will use what is called RISC typically, which is for a reduced instruction set computer. So it's basically a different way of writing assembler. That said, the division between uh, a RISC and CISC kind of implementation of instruction set has blurred. ARM no longer really uses true RISC, but nonetheless, we'll get to that more technical side of things later on. The other aspect of non-portability is the operating system. Now, general aspects of assembler programming, for example, just looping and things like that, that by and large is not dependent on the operating system. But as soon as you start doing things that are slightly more complicated, you'll have to deal with operating system differences. And the most notable distinction is with what we refer to as a different function ABI or the application binary interface. Windows sets up a stack frame for a function call differently than Linux sets up a stack frame for a function call, which means if you have implemented your assembler programming for Windows, it will not necessarily run on Linux. And particularly, this is the case if you're linking it with languages like C and C++. We're going to focus on the Linux side, so everything must work on Linux for this course, but it is worth noting that you have to change things slightly between the two. The other aspect is that different operating systems have different system calls available to you. Windows has different system calls at your disposal than Linux does. So if you wrote a program that relied on a Windows system call, it's not necessarily going to work on a Linux system because it doesn't have the same system call available to you because they fundamentally have different kernels. So we have a different interface to that operating system. The last aspect is which bit mode we are working in. So we have 16, 32, and 64 bit versions of x86 assembler. We're going to be focusing on 64 bit mode. You'll see that we can kind of mix and match to some extent the instructions, but specifically with regards to system calls and things like that, we're going to rely on the 64 bit mode. And you need to make sure that all your programs are actually uh, constructed and linked in 64-bit mode. So I'll go through how we can actually do that shortly, but just keep in mind, everything must be in 64-bit mode. But in terms of non-portability, obviously if I wrote my program to work in 32-bit mode and I was trying to run it in a system that's only 16-bit, I will run into issues and the program won't execute correctly. So non-portability is a big concern with assembler. The other aspect is it's difficult to program. Much like you will probably get more bang for your buck trying to implement some simple functionality using Python than C++, the same is true in that assembler will take considerably longer to code and debug than, say, even C++. So it is definitely a more time-consuming kind of language to implement in, but you need to make that compromise if you're trying to really maximize from a speed perspective. There's also caveats there because it's not always that trivial to fully maximize performance, but it is the trade-off that you're making. You get more flexibility such that you have the ability to maximize performance. However, it does require more time on your side. Other things to keep in mind is the syntax is not that akin to normal programming languages. So you see that point there that the syntax does not resemble mathematics. You don't see instructions like the following in assembler. Everything in assembler is done via what we'll call mnemonics. So you might have something like an add instruction that is going to take two registers and store the result in RAX. We'll get to that shortly, but it definitely stops looking like your nice equations that we used to have. The other thing is you have no structure or syntactic protection. If you want a loop or an if statement, you have to build it from the ground up in assembler. We'll be doing this all relying on go-to statements in essence, so jumps. You don't have any of that functionality available to you. The other thing is the language itself doesn't provide any protection in that if I jump to a location that is not even in my code body, it will be accepted as a perfectly reasonable instruction. The program's likely going to crash, but it's not going to prevent you from doing it. The other thing that's interesting about assembler programming is there aren't types. In essence, the data represents whatever you want it to represent. So you could try and use a pointer as a floating point number, probably not successfully, but the language does not distinguish. It sees data as data. If you have 64 bits of memory, that could represent anything. It's not labeled in any kind of way. So it's up to you as a programmer to keep track of what that data should mean for you. So it's something that can be quite challenging with assembler programming as well.
The last thing is the way in which we access variables. Luckily, everyone in this class has a fair bit of C++ programming, but by and large, if you want to access a variable in assembler, the access is pretty much akin to dereferencing a pointer because you'll have it in an address and you need to use that address to get access to the value stored at that address. So variable access is pretty much like using pointers the whole time. So that's something to keep in mind and you'll get used to that as we go. On the upside, as I said, everyone's coded in C++ here. So that's not too much of a jump. If you'd never coded in C++, this could be quite a, quite a shift to get used to. So I've discussed some of the downsides of using assembler as a programming language or as a language in general. So what are the upsides? What, what do we actually get from it? Well, the, the most touted advantage is that assembler language is fast and this is very much true. I mean, assembler language is pretty much directly communicating with the CPU. So if you ever had a chance of getting maximal performance out, assembler language is your, your best bet. However, an optimized C or C++ compiler will likely be able to create faster assembler code from your C++ than a novice at assembler. So there's a lot of effort that needs to get put into assembler programming to get sufficiently proficient to actually beat a C or C++ compiler. Generally speaking, the times where you can make the biggest gains are when the instruction set has been updated or it has more kind of nuanced instructions that C or C++ are not directly using, but you can leverage their use in your program. So that's the kind of situation where you can really capitalize on having assembler language at your disposal. The other thing is C and C++ generally kind of make some concessions because they're trying to be general. Whereas if you're writing an assembler, you may be in a situation where you're prepared to make some compromises such that your code really only runs on some subset of available architecture. And as such, you can actually try and eke out extra performance as a result of that compromise and use of specialized instructions. The other thing is assembler programs are small. There's no bloat. You'll see even a simple Hello World program in C++ if you disassemble that code, so the object file basically, if you disassemble that object file, you will see that there's a lot of extra kind of bloatware around or boilerplate code around the kind of meat of the code. So even something small, like maybe five lines of C++ code might suddenly become 30 lines of assembler. Whereas in the assembler language directly, you don't need to worry about that boilerplate and you kind of can kind of execute or create the program more directly. So you can save considerably on space. That said, I think this is probably less of a, an issue nowadays than it was in the past. Generally, we're not that constrained for memory. We have a fair bit of RAM unless you're doing something very complicated. But then again, the complication that requires a larger amount of RAM often is a result of large data sets or 3D models and things like that. So it's not so much the program itself that is occupying too much space. The one exception here is still embedded systems. So for example, the code that runs on things like your washing machine and the like, that often is still somewhat constrained because the smaller you can make your program, the less actual memory they need to give that embedded system. So it's cheaper to produce. So it's still relevant, but it's not as relevant as I would say it has been in the past. The other thing is assembler can do things that are not possible in C or C++. You can directly execute IO instructions. It's because you're speaking to the kernel directly. Now you can speak to the kernel via C++, but you kind of do it indirectly through an interface. And you can also do specific CPU based things like direct IO instructions, manage memory mapping registers, manipulate other control registers. For example, you can use an instruction that changes where the next instruction will be that is executed. So you have that kind of functionality that you can't really exploit in C++. That said, the situations where you need to use such esoteric things are not as prevalent, but it's still nice to know that you have in essence maximal control at this level. Now, one thing to keep in mind that I have seen some people kind of misunderstand about assembler programming is though you can do virtually anything that the system will allow, the operating system is still kind of the big brother here that is saying yes or no to your requests. So you'll hear people saying, oh wait, I wrote this line of assembler program and it wiped my hard drive. You don't need to worry about doing anything like that. That is not going to happen because you have an operating system underneath your code. If you're writing machine code without the presence of an operating system and you're trying to directly access things, you could make a mistake, but you don't need to worry about that because we're doing all this programming on top of Linux. So if the Linux kernel says no, your program's not going to allow you to do that. So just something to keep in mind and you don't need to worry about that side of things. So what are the, the big upsides for ordinary mortals? So 
you're taking this course, you've decided that we want to learn some assembler programming. So what can we actually gain from this if our aim isn't to become assembler masters? What do we really benefit? Well, the one thing is it teaches you how your programs really work. Now, obviously, if you program at all, you will know that different languages provide different levels of abstraction available to you. So languages like Python live at a relatively high level of, of abstraction, where C++ is a little bit more low level, and obviously assembler is as low level as we can pretty much go. But being able to traverse those different levels of abstraction are very important as a computer scientist because when you see a new problem, it's important to be able to assess what level of abstraction is best to solve that actual problem. Now, if you only know one level of abstraction, so say you could only ever program in Python and you found C++ and assembler too much, you will always be stuck as that being your lower bound of abstraction, that you can never use something more close to the machine. However, now we're basically giving you the lowest level of abstraction in that you're as close as to the hardware as you virtually can get, which means if you see a new problem, you know exactly where you can actually implement the task. You still have the ability to decide, wait, this is sufficient uh, the simple for me to implement it in Python and then you can go with that but you might say wait I can actually use the hardware better to exploit some structure in this problem and solve it more optimally and then I can actually go down to the assembler level and actually exploit that capability so learning how to traverse those levels of abstraction are really useful as a computer scientist obviously we're also going to learn things like how or learn about things about how storage and arithmetic is done in registers base instructions pretty much will show that to you you'll also see how c and c plus plus function uh, register and stack usage works you'll see the construction of stack frames how we build and destroy them you'll also see why if you have too deep a uh, recursion you end up getting stack overflow it's not just a website it's something that will happen if you have too deep deep recursion and we'll see that later why that happens in essence it's because you have too many stack frames built upon each other and at some point you run out of stack space which we'll get to later but it's good to understand how that is all actually done it's not just magic behind the instruction call it's actually a very tangible little bit of structure that we can use to emulate that kind of behavior we also figure out how optimization of certain things actually works in practice or why is one way of doing something in C++ better than another. Oftentimes you'll hear that, oh, this is faster than the other way, but without actually knowing why it's faster, it's, it's harder to explain. A very simple example, which I'll go through a little later in detail is fundamentally, if you don't have any optimization enabled by your compiler, the instruction I or plus plus I is actually faster than I plus plus. And it's because one can be implemented using just one instruction, a same instruction, and the other requires two. So even something as trivial as this, if you understand it at an assembler level, you can see which is actually going to be faster. Now, I say it depends on what compiler optimization you're using, because even if you are enable O2 optimization on C++, this kind of becomes irrelevant, but it's still important to know why it's actually happening. Now, the other point about bugs are more immediately related to machine instructions and limitations. Things like null pointer should become a little bit clearer to you in this context, as well as, as I mentioned, stack overflow. The other thing is you have to appreciate how a compiler converts your C++ code into executable instructions by your computer. And for that reason, if we can implement all of these structures listed below directly in assembler, you get a good sense of how your compiler is able to achieve the same thing. The last point is your coding will improve, or at least it should improve, because you have a better understanding of what's really happening. So the idea in some sense of the assembler programming is to remove any kind of black box that you had in your mind about programming. There's no longer a situation where I'm just going to pass into my, my black box my function call and just hope it does what's necessary. I now will know exactly what goes into that box and how that box is built. So where does assembler programming fit into the generation of programming languages? Now, obviously, if you do COS333, you'll go into far more detail about this generational changes between different types of programming languages. But specifically, assembler language is referred to as the second generation of programming languages. So it's basically just one step up from raw machine code. The upside is that you have names for instructions. So for example, I can use the mnemonic move as opposed to for example needing to know that it's some specific combination of binary by the way that's not the actual code but regardless the point is still the same that it's much easier to actually memorize a 
a mnemonic like move than to actually remember binary for each instruction. The same thing applies for using labels for variables and things like that. So that's where assembler fits in. You obviously get more recent generations. We have the third generation, which is pretty much what you guys spend most of your time programming in. So your C++ and your Java pretty much fit into that generation. You see listed here all the languages like Fortran, COBOL and Lisp, but you probably haven't implemented anything in them. You should gain some experience in Lisp when you do COS333, but the other two are a little bit, little bit scarcer. Fortran, surprisingly enough, is still quite prevalent amongst um, physicists because it's still a very fast language to implement in. Though it's not widespread, it's, it's more widespread than one would expect it to be. Then the fourth and the fifth generational changes are somewhat more debatable. The fourth generation is generally deemed for domain-specific languages. The most kind of tangible example of that that you would have encountered is SQL. It's kind of designed for a very niche use case, and that's referred to as a fourth generational language. Then we have what's, in my opinion, personally at least, has been a bit of a failure generation, which is the fifth generation. So the premise there being is that you describe the problem and the computer will generate the algorithm. The most prevalent example of that is logic programming. So we see we have prolog listed here. Again, cos333 will actually go through more prolog pro kind of programming. But you'll actually find that logic programming is very hard because describing the problem in sufficient detail such that the system can actually generate the algorithm is almost harder than actually writing the algorithm yourself. So it's a little bit of a nice idea, not well enough executed yet to be that useful in practice. Some people will swear by Prolog, but it's very much an esoteric kind of language. Here you'll see we have our first, first actual assembler program. It's very much the the simplest program we can realistically construct. Basically, all this program does is it starts and then self-terminates. So it does very little other than exist for a small couple of nanoseconds and then kill itself. So simplest program we can possibly implement, but it's a good example for us to work from so we know what some of the syntax actually means. And we're going to obviously be building on this as we proceed with the course. So the first thing to kind of note, the semicolon notation is used to indicate a comment and it will not be uncommon in an assembler or a bit of assembler code to find a comment attached to every single instruction now that may feel like it's a little bit overkill i mean if you write uh, high level languages you don't generally have to overdo comments it's generally better that your code is somewhat self-explanatory and you have some descriptive comments inside there if necessary but in assembler language, comments are very much a necessity because it becomes very hard to follow assembler code, particularly if you're not very used to it. It's quite easy to kind of not immediately see the intention of code unless you explicitly step through each instruction, which obviously if I looked at a language like C++ or you, if you looked at a language like Java, you can generally eyeball a bit of code and have a good sense of what's going on. So what else is going on in this code? So as I said, the first thing is what a comment looks like. The other thing is what are labels? Labels are strings, which are not instructions. So in essence, we see we have one label in this code, this underscore, underscore start, followed by a colon. This is a label. Label is basically some kind of name that we use to reference a specific location in memory. So when this code actually gets turned into actual machine instruction, this start label will correspond to some physical address. But for our purposes, I can simply jump to, for example, start, and the actual assembler is understanding where I need to jump to. So it kind of keeps a track record of what the corresponding memory location would have been. So that's what we use a label for. Now you'll see here that usually starts in column one. Again, there's no structural imposition in assembler. This is just convention that people normally follow. I recommend that you use it because assembler is hard enough to follow as is, so rather stick to the convention, but the assembler itself is not gonna moan at you if you break it. And then you have the option of actually ending it with a colon or not. So in the situation where it's a standalone label, you need to use the colon. If it is not standalone, it's not explicitly required, but it doesn't hurt to just simply always use the colon to make things as clear as possible that this is in fact a label and it's not just an instruction.
Then we have a couple of instructions present in this example. You'll see that we have two move instructions and then an int instruction. Now that int you see at the bottom is not int as in integer, it's int as in interrupt. Now in essence, in 32-bit assembler, if you want to execute a system call, you use int x80. By the way, this x80 indicates that this corresponds to the, the hexadecimal number 80, not the normal decimal number 80. And it will execute a system call based on what parameters you have loaded into EAX and EBX. So you can kind of think of this as the first one indicates what function that you're calling. The second one is in essence a parameter. So in some ways this is function one that's been passed a parameter of five and then being executed. You'll see that this is a little bit different when we do 64-bit system calls. Uh, but you'll see this is a very simple hello world type of example where they'll use a 32-bit system call. But I'll show you the 64-bit one shortly. Move obviously is just a simple move command, but we'll go into full detail of how all the instructions work. So don't worry, uh, worry about that at the moment. Just as a general note, I refer to this as a machine instruction, but you'll see some places refer to this as opcodes. So different instructions correspond to different opcodes or the machine corresponding or the machine uh, equivalent of that mnemonic. So there might be some corresponding integer to every instruction, but you don't need to worry about that. Both segment and global are what we refer to as assembler instructions uh, or pseudo ops. So it's not a machine instruction, it's an assembler instruction. And in essence, the assembler uses these commands or these instructions to figure out how to build the actual final program. It's not something that's executed on the machine explicitly. In this case, the segment.txt is basically the way in which we indicate that what follows is going to actually be the code. You'll see later we get different aspects of an actual piece of program, you'll have segment.data and segment.bss and so on. But that segment.txt indicates that what is underneath this line is in fact executable code. Global underscore start is in essence the way in which the assembler indicates the start point of your code. So you can think of it as saying, okay, I want to always start my program executing from underscore start. Now, it is perfectly possible that you could have a situation where you have global start and you actually have some instructions before that statement and then I only have underscore start over here and then I have the rest of my instructions now this means that if your program was assembled and linked like this you'll always still start at this point and this instruction will by and large be never executed that will be part of your actual program that's just something to keep in mind So just to kind of break things down as a full example, the here part is the label for this individual instruction. The move is our opcode or our machine instruction and EAX and one are what we call operands. So all instructions will have between, well, you have some operands have zero instructions, but all, sorry, some opcodes have zero operands, but generally speaking, you'll have one, two, or in some cases, three operands to any kind of structure instruction. In essence, you can simply think of operands as the parameters to the assembler instruction, sorry, to the machine instruction. This is just going into a little bit more detail about what I discussed about what the section and global keywords mean. Something that is worth mentioning at this point is that generally speaking, our initial assembler programs are going to start at underscore start. It's kind of the convention of your initial entry point into your program. However, languages like C++, you will think main should be your intro to your program. But actually what ends up happening is that start is always going to underscore start is always going to be the entry point into your program, which actually indirectly will go and execute or call the main function. So regardless of whether you have a main function in C++ or you're writing directly with assembler, your first entry point will actually always be that underscore start or whatever we've actually pointed global to. But the actual convention with C++ and GCC compilers is to use underscore start. So once we've written our assembler program, we obviously want to actually be able to create an executable from it. So how do we go about that? 
Well, assuming that our assembler instructions that we saw in this slide was all stored in a file called exit.asm, we can create our executable file using the following instruction. First thing to note here is that all programs or all assembler programs in this module must be assembled using YASM. YASM is available for Linux in most uh, packages. In some packages it will actually be there by default, for others you should be able to install it pretty straightforward. Please do not use NASM. They are similar, but there are certain caveats and you will come short if you start using NASM. So please make sure that you always use YASM. YASM in some sense was a rewrite of NASM, but it actually has continual support today and it's what we're gonna be focusing on for this course. So please don't, don't accidentally start using NASM and watching some YouTube videos or the like and not being able to actually come back to using YASM. So what else is going into this instruction? You'll see there's quite a few commands at play here. So let's break them down. Not all of them are actually strictly necessary. That said, I feel like you may as well use the longer version to make your program because we actually want a lot of the functionality available from some of these extra commands. So the first thing that is in fact necessary is this dash F. So obviously dash F, it means, or it implies in this case at least, format. So what format should the object file be that is created? And in our case, we're going to be using ELF64, which basically means we are telling the system we want a 64-bit object file. Where here ELF stands for Extensible Linking Format. And this is a very good test to see if your system properly supports 64-bit as it's currently set up, because this command will fail if you're not actually in 64-bit Linux. So make sure that you're able to execute 64-bit Linux. If you are natively running Ubuntu or something like that, you shouldn't have any issues. If you're running a virtual machine, you may have to spend a bit of time trying to actually get 64-bit working. Uh, so make sure you get that going before the prax really starts. So spend your weekend, if that doesn't work, making sure that is working. Um, all 64-bit CPUs are capable of this. But if you have a Linux virtual machine running on top of Windows, you may have to go into your BIOS and change one or two settings to allow 64-bit mode to work correctly. Then the next kind of command, if you will, or kind of setting is dash G, and this is used to indicate what debugging information we want. Now, it's not critical to actually use dash G followed by the format you wish to use, if you don't plan on debugging. However, for this course, as I mentioned earlier, we want to be able to debug. Specifically, we want to be able to use GDB and Dwarf 2 is a sufficiently good format to work well with GDB. Now, surprisingly, or perhaps unsurprisingly, the meaning of Dwarf is not actually the same as ELF in that ELF corresponds to a nice mnemonic or a, an acronym rather. Dwarf was simply decided upon because it was a nice counterpart to ELF. And it's a clear indication that computer scientists made this kind of specification. Um, the last parameter that we see here is dash L. And this is what we use to create a listing file. So basically a listing file is a file that will show the assembler instructions as well as the machine instruction next to it. This is a good way of checking how large instructions are or what's perhaps going on. Again, it's not a necessary parameter to actually use, but the listing file can be useful for understanding what's going on under the hood. Now, once we've executed this command, we're left with an object file. So we're close to an executable, but not quite there yet. So we need to actually turn our object file into an executable. Now, in order to do that, we use a very simple program, which I will get to shortly. Um, it's called LD and it will do the linking for you. But before I get to LD, I just wanna show you what a listing file looks like. You'll see here that this is the listing file for our exit program. So on the left is pretty much the raw assembler where this first column let's just call this column one, actually corresponds to the memory addresses. So you'll see this is at memory address 0000. 000. 
then this instruction is at 0005 and so forth. Again, all these memory addresses are shown to you in hexadecimal. And then what you see over here in column two is the actual machine code. So you can unpack this and from that you'll actually be able to get out different aspects of which part of this means move, which one points to the register, and which part is actually pointing to this immediate value one. Now you don't need to know that correspondence. I will never ask you uh, what, what is the machine code for MOLV. I'll never do something like that, but it is interesting to see what's actually happening completely under the hood. It's also a clear indication here that those assembler instructions do not actually form part of the actual instructions that get executed. So as I mentioned, we need to link our object file or turn our object file into an executable. So in our case, at least for the first couple of tasks or first couple of us, uh, practicals you'll do, we'll be using LD and basically it's a very simple, simple instruction. LD should be present on virtually all Linux distributions without need to install. If it's not, you can very quickly install it. it, should be there by default. And basically the way in which you use it is you pass it an O file, you indicate the name that you want the output to have and you simply specify LD to execute that actual program. Now, by default, if you don't specify a name for exit, it will simply be a.out, and that's perfectly fine for most purposes, but I'd recommend for your own sanity to just label things as clear as possible. When we get to the situation that we want to actually integrate our programs with C++ and C, we then need to make use of GCC, and then we're going to start compiling our programs or linking our programs rather using GCC. So what will actually happen then is we'll use Yasm to build an O file, GCC to create an O file from our corresponding C files, and then we'll use GCC to link those two O files. Now again, don't worry about that too much for the moment. We'll only really need to do that when we get to the functions in assembler, but it is something to keep in mind that the manner in which you link will change. And then lastly, to execute the program we've created, we simply use our standard command to actually execute a program in Linux. There's one small thing I want to mention to you from chapter two of the assembler book, and that's about um, the IEEE floating point representation for, uh, for numbers, is the manner in which it will appear to you if you actually look at that number in the listing file. Now, you'll get a bit of a recap on how we actually build these this IEEE format of the floating point number in the theory lectures. So don't worry too much about that, but the manner in which it will be shown to you is a little bit different. So I wanna kind of illustrate that so it's not a surprise or it adds some unnecessary confusion. So say I have the number 1.75. Now, if I convert this to be in the 32-bit IEEE 754 standard for floating point numbers, by the way, there aren't really other in-use standards for floating point numbers. There are some exceptions on GPU, but you can by and large assume that's the primary one that is present. But if I were to convert my number into binary, I will get the following representation where the first value is basically representative of the sign. Then we have the component that represents the power. And then lastly, we have the bit that represents the mantissa, or as you'll see, the book refers to this as the significant. Okay, now you may expect this number to look a certain way in the listing file. So the first thing note to note is that all numbers are going to be shown to you in hexadecimal. It's just a standard convention by and large in assembler, particularly in the listing file. So the way I can convert this representation to hex is very easy. All I have to do is I need to group uh, sections of four bits, so basically four bit group, four bit group, four bit group, all the way through until I get to the end of the list. And then each of the corresponding four bits represents a binary number. So in this case, one one represents three or all ones is the largest number, which is 15, which will just be F. Now, with this in mind, you may expect to see the following present in your listing file if I had the value 1.75 stored. However, what you'll actually see is the following. Now in essence, what is happening here is that this is stored in reverse order. 
with each nibble pair swapped. Now, if you're not used to this terminology, nibble means half a byte, okay? So you have one byte, and in one byte there are two nibbles. Now, this, an this biscuit analogy goes further in that two bits is often referred to as a crumb. But this term nibble is quite prevalent in assembler programming because a nibble is exactly what's necessary to represent a hexadecimal number. So make sure you understand how you can go from number one to number two. You'll actually see when we get into the, the concept of which way in which you store the bits, whether we're storing big Indian or little Indian, why this is the case. But for the moment, just note, if I want to get from one to two, in essence, I need to reverse the string and then swap each nibble pair. So if I were to have just converted these or laid this out in complete reverse order, it would have ended up looking like this for the first two nibbles, and that's why they've been swapped to be 3F. Okay, the same thing applies is that this would have been EO, but again, you see that actually what's represented is just the swap version of the nibbles. Now, the last two are obviously kind of irrelevant because they're the same swapped or not swapped. But make sure you understand how you get from one to two. So let's look at our listing file, just as an example. Now we discussed very briefly the, the text segment, and that's where all our instructions were. The other segment that is going to be very important for you, particularly when we start programming in assembly, is the dot data sec section. You can basically think of this as a, a bunch of predefined um, variables. They're not explicitly constants because you are able to change them, but you'll see sometimes they're used as constants to make things easy. So what you see present in the first column is the label. You can kind of think of this as a variable name or more specifically, it's the name that refers to the specific address. So you can kind of think of it as the pointer name. And we have here zero, one, negative one, A, B, D, E, and we wanna kind of assign specific values to them in the data segment. So there are two aspects here. The first one to consider, or that is present in column two, is basically the size of the data. So their DD stands for double word data, or double data word, and that basically means that whatever we're about to assign to this location is of going to be of 32 bits in size okay so that comes from the simple fact that a word at least in x86 assembler one word is equal to two bytes and because it's a double data word it's going to be four bytes which is simply equal to 32 bits Okay, so that DD simply means that we're going to be storing those values as 32-bit values. Now, there are obviously different ones you can specify. Specifically, we can specify DW for a data word, so that's just going to be two bytes, DB for a single byte, and then lastly, which we'll actually use quite frequently in 64-bit assembler, is DQ for a data quad word. So in essence, it means that we have four words which basically means we're gonna have four times two bytes. So it's gonna be eight bytes, which is 64 bits, which is where we're gonna live for a large portion of this module. But we will be needing to use different size chunks of data. So we won't always have the luxury of using the 64-bit version, but it is probably where we'll spend most of our time. Now the third column you see listed over here represents the different values we're storing. The one upside of using an assembler is that when we assign these constants up front, the assembler does the conversion for us. So in essence, if it sees this dot, it knows it's a floating point number and it will do the conversion for us. So it's the one time assembler is being nice to us. Now, for the moment, assume that we've put this data segment in fp.asm and I've created a listing file. Let's actually see what that listing file looks like. So again, this first column is simply going to be the addresses. So column one is our addresses. And column two is kind of where the, where the magic happens, if you will. So this is the actual converted version of these floating point numbers stored in the IEEE 754 standard. So 
as an example here, if you look at this 1.75, I already showed you how that conversion will happen. You see here that I have this 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, E0, F or 3 F, and that's exactly what we end up have having stored over here. If you want to have a little bit of practice with understanding how this works, you can try and, for example, convert 1.1 into floating point or into the floating point standard, and then see if you can actually get to this value. Just as a general note, 1.1 is obviously going to be quite an ugly binary number because 0 0.1 does not have a nice exact representation in binary. The next topic I'm going to discuss is a little bit of a recap from COS 1 to 2. So if you feel like you're very comfortable with this concept, you feel free to skip ahead a little bit. But I think for the sake of completeness, it's useful to go through it. So the concept I want to discuss is memory mapping. And in essence, memory mapping relates directly to virtual memory. And it's a concept that I think is quite important to keep in mind, particularly when we're working at the exact level of addresses of data inside a program. Now, obviously, computer memory as a whole is in essence a contiguous block of memory. So you can think of us having an array from 0 to n minus 1 um, locations where n is the memory size. But generally speaking, the way in which we access specific blocks in that array of memory is not correlated precisely to physical memory locations. So we work with what we call the logical address within our program, and that is mapped to a physical address. So even though we may have an array that appears contiguous to us, it is very possible that this nth element is in fact stored somewhere else on physical memory. So even though in the logical address space, the memory we're working with may be contiguous, it's not necessarily the case that it is going to be contiguous on the physical hardware. Now, this level of abstraction is very useful for us because it means we don't really need to worry about what other programs are doing. We just need to concern ourselves with our own memory addresses. So that's why we work with just logical addresses and the same applies to assembler programming. Even at that low level, we don't explicitly work with uh, physical memory directly. It is actually somewhat more possible to do, but if we make proper system calls and things like that, we're in essence working with logic memory or logical address space. Now, you may assume that there's a little bit of a kind of computational cost to doing something like this, but in practice, the actual expense of converting a logical address to a physical address is basically entirely negligible. Historically, you could use things like a TLB or a translation lookaside buffer to speed up this process. Uh, but even if it's emulated with some degree of software in the kernel, it's really a negligible consideration. So you don't need to worry about optimizing that away in any sense. All programs, by and large, on modern hardware are assumed to be running in logical address space. Now, something to kind of keep in mind is that, generally speaking, when we talk about memory, we don't talk about addressing or moving around specific bytes. Now, what generally actually happens is our CPU will rather work with full pages. And the idea being that it will try and ensure at least that every page that we have in a logical address space is fully contiguous, both in the logical address space as well as in the physical address space. So that's kind of our non-divisible entity. Obviously, you can do memory management at a level more granular than pages if you aren't working through an operating system. But generally speaking, we rely on an operating system to do this kind of, kind of partitioning for us. So we're stuck with the page size that our operating system decides on. Now, with Linux, and specifically Ubuntu that you'll be working with, the page size, generally speaking, is going to be of 4 kilobytes. So if you're working with a piece of memory, you can assume you generally have a contiguous chunk of 4K, um, so you have a full page. Now, if you breach that page boundary, it's very possible that you move to a, a page that is not necessarily aligned or next to the page that you're originally in. It can obviously be next to it, but you don't have that guarantee. And we then have an extra kind of size specification available to us, which is a 2 megabyte page. Generally speaking, only the kernel is allowed to use that size pages, so you don't have to worry too much about it from a programming standpoint, but it's good to know that there are two different kind of page systems or page sizes that are in the system. But fundamentally, you can think of a page kind of being the indivisible size unit that the operating system will manage between the mapping from physical and uh, logical address space. So it will never 
only allocate you half of a page in physical address space. You will always get a full page of memory given to you, even if you don't necessarily use the whole page. You do also get a kind of a, a variant of this where with a little bit of trickery, you can get larger size pages. You can get up to a one gig page. You don't need to worry too much about, about doing that. It's a very niche use case, so it's not really relevant to us. And generally speaking, the operating system is not that willing to allow you to do something like that. So how does this translation happen? I mean, I, there's obviously some kind of computation that can be done. It can be implemented in many ways. We'll go through a couple of ways to implement it in the next lecture. But for the moment, you can think of it as being a simple lookup in that I give the system my logical address and it's actually gonna simply convert that to a physical address. So I don't need to worry about it, but that conversion is happening. But let's kind of run through a bit of an example to break down some of the pieces and to understand what portion of our address is actually being converted to a physical address place and what portion of that address is actually just being used as an offset. So as I mentioned, we're gonna assume we have 4K pages. And because we have 4K pages, we need 12 bits to uniquely address all of those 4K um, bytes inside that page. I mean, just to kind of give you context, I mean, two to the 12 is in essence equal to 4K. Okay, so that's where that corresponds to. One kilobit can be represented with two to the 10, and then obviously we want four, so it's two to the two times two to the 10, which will just give us two to the 12. Now, because we want to be able to uniquely identify all of the specific bytes inside our page, so we have our page sitting over here, and it's got individual bytes. We wanna try and uniquely address all of those bytes we are going to need to somehow be able to say, are we looking at the first byte, the second byte, the third byte, and so forth. And as I said, to uniquely identify all of these bytes, you're going to need to have 12 bits at your disposal to uniquely identify all of them, which means if I had an address like the one over here, I actually would need to use a certain number of those assembler or sorry, rather a certain number of those hex values to actually uniquely refer to it. Again, just as a reminder, zero X means that these are hexadecimal values. So each kind of character there corresponds to four bits. So if I say that I need to use 12 bits to uniquely identify all of the components of my page, it means that I'll actually need to use these bottom three um, entries to uniquely identify each of those bytes in my page. So from our original address, we have two components here. We kind of have the main, the main, uh, the full address space, but of that we have the component which represents the offset, so just the lower three bytes, or in this case the least significant three uh, hex values rather, instead of lower three bytes, so the lower three, or the lower 12 bits, or three hex values. And then we have the higher order hex values which we use to represent the page number. So, when we're writing a program and we have a page number like this 43215, uh, that is a page number in logic address space, and we need to utilize the CPU to try and do the conversion for us. And in essence, what will happen is that this will get mapped to some specific page location in physical memory. So say, for example, we did a lookup and we found, okay, wait, that page location actually corresponds to the page 8, nine three then all we know is that that's where we should start looking in the physical address space and then to get to the specific byte that we want to access we just add the offset to the lower order bits so in essence the address that we will start looking at is actually the following and if i want to gain access to the first bit then this value is simply zero if i wanted to gain access to say the fourth bit then instead of having a zero here i would just have a three so this mapping is relatively straightforward Obviously at the moment, this 7830 was just a concocted value, but this is generally stored in some kind of lookup table. We'll go through again how we can store that in an efficient way, but for the moment, just knowing that translation is sufficient. So what are the benefits of actually doing memory mapping? Now again, you should have gone through a fair amount of this in COS122, but just to kind of, kind of remind you of some of the benefits is that the user processes are protected from each other. It basically means that if I have program A and program B, nothing that I do while I'm inside program A can in any way affect program B. Now there are some 
special cases where I could explicitly set up communication between the processors, but by default that is not the case. They operate as independent entities and I can't negatively or directly actually influence any of the data in B and vice versa. So B can't affect A and A cannot affect B. And this obviously gives us many upsides in that we don't need to worry too much about security. There are some things still to consider. This is not a perfect solution, but it avoids unnecessary complexity. Now, I mean, you can see what the issue would be if a program shared the same address space directly as that say, I had my newly installed program and I was busy executing lines of code. So say I'm at these specific memory addresses and I'm going down and there's a very critical bit of code higher up in memory. So say this is the kernel. If I had non separate separate um, address spaces, I could potentially be working down here and jump into code from another process and then potentially either execute code. I shouldn't have the sufficient privileges to execute. So I basically surpass asking the, the kernel for permission to do something and I just directly do it. Or I might be in a situation where I can extract data that was maybe privileged, like user information and things like that. So having the connection impossible and then in essence operating in them their own little silos is a very effective way of preventing that kind of kind of issue. So what are the benefits of studying memory mapping? Is it something we can just completely ignore? Now, if you write a high level program in say C++ or Java, generally speaking, you're not too phased about memory mapping. And even to a, a degree in assembly, you can somewhat ignore it. But it is important to be aware that it is happening because a lot of times performance related issues, particularly when we get to the high performance assembler, um, can be mitigated by understanding how this mapping is done and also certain kind of errors that you may have encountered when coding in C++ will kind of make more sense if you think about this notion of having these indivisible, indivisible pages and this mapping between a logical address space and a physical address space. So I'll kind of go through two examples to try and illustrate this point. So the simplest one in terms of an error you may have encountered, you may have had a situation where you had some code in C++ and you were say, for example, iterating through this array and you would just say adding up all the values. So you'd simple code, you just had to loop through the array and sum up all the values. So you had five, six, seven, and nine, and your code would just loop through and return the value. But now you, you made an error and you have an off by one error. And instead of adding up four elements here, you actually went further than you should have. And you added a value from an, an element that is actually not maybe even initialized, but you've never set any value in it. So it was an array of size four and you're accessing the fifth element. Now, in a language like Java, it will immediately prohibit you from doing this. It has protection. C++, however, doesn't. So it would often let you add that value. And the question is, what will happen at runtime? Now, two things could happen at runtime. One, you could end up getting a segmentation fault. Or, and in many ways, slightly more annoyingly, the program will simply run and complete as expected, but the answer it gives you will be wrong. The reason the answer it gives you is wrong is that it's going to just add whatever was in memory at that location. Now the question you have to ask yourself is why does it sometimes execute and give me the wrong answer, whereas other times I get a stack um, or a segmentation fold error? Why, why, why is it a different outcome depending on when I run it? Or in some different situations that sometimes off by one errors is going to be a segmentation fault and sometimes it isn't. So what's happening? Now the reason that actually occurs is if you recall that I said that we don't really divide past a page. So even if your array was stored in this page, so let's just call this our page. And we had the value stored here, five, six, so on. And I went past the end of the array. So I try to add something one further than the end of the array. If that element was actually still within the page, I would simply actually add whatever value was at that address in memory. Whether I've instantialized, instantiated or if it's just stale memory, I will simply add it. No segmentation fault occurs. However, if I'm in a situation where my array is near the boundary of this page and I try and access memory that is one past or at least one past the end of the page, I'll immediately get a segmentation fault. So that's why it's important to understand that the concept of paging is happening in the background and it explains why sometimes you would get a segmentation fault and sometimes you wouldn't get a segmentation fault. The other thing to keep in mind in terms of performance is that access between contiguous elements inside a page is relatively quick. So say for example, I'm looping through and I'm adding this element and then this element, it's very quick accesses. There's nothing slowing things down. 
However, as soon as I try and access, and say this memory actually is while instantiated and I intend to access it, I try and access an element that's in a separate page. Now a bunch of extra admin may have to happen by the operating system. It might have to say, oh wait, is this page in fact in memory? Is it not in memory? Do I need to load that into um, my memory so that I can actually have sufficient access to it? So there could be a sudden slowdown going from elements in this page to this page. And you can actually write your code in such a manner that you minimize that kind of necessity to load in an extra page. So more formally, you can try and rewrite code such that you get a minimized or minimize the number of page faults that you encounter because a page fault is quite a slow um, thing for an operating system to do, at least comparatively. So in this context, I got a page fault when I try to access an element that wasn't already loaded into physical memory yet. I needed to try and retrieve it and kind of pull it back to my system. There's a little bit more complexity there than what I've just initially stated, but that's the core idea of why we would like to avoid it. So there's two kind of key benefits for us to keep in mind, or why we should keep in mind memory mapping. So with this in mind, what does our process model look like in Linux? So I said that we kind of work on this logical framework. So our process model or the logical address space that our program runs in does not necessarily reflect the physical RAM on our system. It's something that's kind of devoid from that. And we simply make the relationship when we make a mapping from logical space to physical address space. So what does the logical address space of a typical process in Linux look like? Now, what I'm going to describe here is not wildly different in Windows, but everything here is specifically the actual case in a Linux system. So you can kind of divide your process into four components or your process's logical address space into four components. We have our text segment, and this is basically where all your code is going to live. We then have a data segment, and in essence, this is pre-allocated space. So in our early example where we had that listing file and I instantiated a couple of floating point numbers, all of those would have actually lived in this data segment. So there are two segments or parts of the data segment. There's the data segment, and then there's the BSS segment, which I'll get into more detail as we proceed. But in the large thing to kind of keep in mind is that this is a pre-allocated bit of memory. We then have two other parts of our Linux process or our system uh, process model, and that is the stack and the heap. Now, you have encountered these two terms almost certainly from C++, where if you had dynamic allocation, you would use heap-based memory, and if you didn't use dynamic allocation, everything would kind of live on the stack. Now, what is interesting is that the stack actually grows from the top down, so the start address of the stack is actually the highest address in your Linux process model. And as you add more to the stack, you end up growing the stack downwards, which is a little bit counterintuitive, but it's how it works. And generally speaking, your stack is quite limited in capacity. Different Linux distributions have different capacities, but it is very much a restricted kind of uh, situation. You might have eight megs of stack or something along those lines. It's definitely a lot, not a large amount of space. Your heap grows in the other direction. Your heap grows upwards. So the lowest address in the heap is um, the start of the heap. And as you add more things to the heap, uh, you move up in address space. Now, what is interesting actually is that there is no check that gets done by the kernel whether or not these two lines ever cross each other. So if your heap expanded past your stack, the program won't actually be doing that check. It will probably crash in some horrific way, but the actual system is not doing that if statement check every time because it's kind of an for the most part, an unnecessary bit of um, inefficiency to have to always do that check. Now, the other thing to note here is this Linux process model is very large. So the logical address space you have available to you is 128 terabytes. Now, it's very unlikely you've ever had to write a program of that size or even had to write a program that loaded that much data in. Um, but this is kind of the capacity of a typical Linux process model. It is possible to breach this doing a couple of uh, extra things, but by and large, this is the, the capacity you have available to you. That said, I, I, for the moment at least, it's very improbable that you'll never ever need to breach 128 terabytes. It's unlikely you have that much hard disk space, let alone uh, need to run a program of that size. So we'll go into each of these components in more detail as we kind of go through the course. Uh, one thing I think I should just maybe point out, which might surprise you a little bit, is that, or why do we actually get to 128? It seems like a slightly odd, odd number. And I say it's a bit odd because we have 64 bits of space to kind of make an address. So why are we not using the full 64 bits available to us 
in terms of addressable space because in essence you could actually address to do the 64 which is quite a large amount bigger than 128 terabytes and actually it's simply the way in which uh, it was decided to implement the 64-bit standard of process models but in essence what happens is so we only use 47 bits to actually represent the address it was a design decision made and 2 to the Oh, sorry, 47 rather, 2 to the 47 corresponds to 128 terabytes. You'll see in the book that there's a number 141 that's in the situation where it's a base 10 number. Now, technically we could try and use all of all of the space available to us and we could actually try and use 64, but it kind of becomes unnecessary. And oftentimes those high order bits are used for slightly more uh, clever tricks. So in multi-level paging, maybe some of them were used for something else. Um, there's also things to kind of distinguish whether or not a specific page was in fact a normal process or normal program page or if it was actually owned by the kernel. So you have a little bit of leeway of how those higher order bits can be used by the actual operating system. So how do we specify these memory segments in assembler? Well, it's very straightforward. Um, we basically specify our code segment simply using segment.text and that's where we're going to actually insert all our code. Something that is actually going to be potentially confusing if you are not expecting it is if you look at your listing file you'll see that underscore start if you implement it the same way that I've shown you will be at address zero but if you actually debug your program and you check the addresses using GDB you'll see that that start address is not quite zero now that is done as kind of a security feature where the start location of your text, data, heap, and stack are somewhat randomized within some kind of tolerance. So it will always be slightly randomly or originated around say zero or in the case of a heap around the top of the process model, but it'll never be at exactly lo those locations. It's kind of a way of preventing certain kind of security attacks so that things are slightly less predictable. Again, that shouldn't affect us because we rely on labels, so we don't need to worry about that too much. But if you are debugging and you're like, okay, why, why is my start label not at zero like I expected? It's simply due to uh, the slight randomization that's done in Linux as a security feature. It is actually possible to turn it off. I don't recommend it, but it is actually possible to turn it off in Linux if you really want to make sure that it's at zero. But again, it's not really of a huge concern. And um, again, we have the data segment, like I mentioned, there are two components of the data segment. We have the dot data, and that's what we used before. And then we have a different segment, which you probably haven't heard before, which is the dot BSS segment. And it's basically there to reserve um, certain amounts of space for some kind of data. So you may say you always know that you're gonna need 128 um, megabytes for some kind of processing. You can kind of pre-allocate it in the dot BSS segment. Um, it stands for block started by symbol, but for the most part, we're gonna pretty much be relying on the dot data segment. In the dot data segment, you have to specify the value of the entities in the dot BSS segment, you don't. Also the dot data segment actually allocates that space explicitly. So if you check the size of your process, everything that you have in dot data will be occupying space. Whereas the dot BSS segment does not necessarily allocate all the space into the executable. It's only created when you launch the program, you'll see that space being allocated. But the exe won't contain extra blank data but if you for example had one gig of constants stored in your data segment you'll have a very large exe but for our purposes you can simply use dot data for everything and as i mentioned we have our stack and a heap and the heap grows up and the stack grows down this is not a segment in our assembler program it's just the way in which we interact with data for the most part we're going to be working with stack based memory later on when we, when we start doing things like arrays we'll end up um, utilizing the heap more explicitly the last thing i want to quickly mention is how you can ascertain the size of your stack on your given linux distribution uh, there are slight variations between different distros with the most standard stack size being 16 megabytes for a 64-bit version of Linux. Ubuntu, unfortunately, is a little bit stingy with its stack and it only gives you 8 megabytes. It is possible to change, but it's not, not trivial. And again, I wouldn't recommend you, you do it. Uh, but what is useful to actually do is to check how much stack space you have. And to do that, all you need to do is just use this ulimit s which will just indicate the stack. And basically, it will return the exact details of how large the Linux kernel has allocated to a given stack. So while eight or 16 megs feels very relatively small, it's actually by and large fine for the vast majority of things. Um, it's only when you start having to work with larger 
data structures that you have to use the heap, but we can get away with using the stack for a considerable number of things actually. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that I said that the stack grows down and what happens is if the size of that stack breaches a given page, it actually triggers to the kernel that you need to allocate an extra page to that actual process, another physical page, and the kernel does that for us. So we don't need to worry about that. If we simply change the stack pointer, which I'll explain how to do when we get there, the kernel immediately is, a, is able to identify that it needs to allocate another physical page to this logical address space for your program.